In other words, nearly half the American populace prefers the belief that Charles Darwin was wrong where it matters most. Right? And so this, this is really the problem. It's not that there are a few wackos out there who can't think straight. It is that about half of the population can't think straight. And that these people vote into office creationists, like Ronald Reagan, like George W. Bush. And we have a very prominent biblical creationist presently as a federal minister, Stockwell Day. And he's not the only guy in the conservative ranks who is in that camp. That is the danger. It's not the few wackos. It's that these people wind up making our public policies. And that is why I'm covering this topic in my classes, right? to get people thinking about what they're up, to, up against. So now, let's think or talk for a moment about what creationism actually is. So here is, in a nutshell, the doctrine of creationism. Right? It's founded on the literal belief in the Bible. And in short ver versions or points, all living things were created within six days and lived contemporaneously. Man lived at the same time as dinosaurs and trilobites. No new organisms appeared after creation. No evolution. All right? Secondly, Earth history is dominated by catastrophic events. The Great Flood, or Deluge, which covered the entire globe with water, extinguished all life forms not saved by the ark. And then we have things like fossils, other remains of organisms that perished in the flood, and we have the Earth is very young. There's also old age creationists, but let's take the young Earth creationists now. The Earth is very young, probably about 10,000 years old, and certainly not millions of years old. All right, so how do you deal with this? Well, let's say this is a hypothesis, and let's say the Bible is literally true, which is what about half of the population seems to think. Now we can test this. And, <laughs> and I'll take Noah's flood, the Noah's Ark's story. It's a wonderful story for children, I might add, just not for adults. Let's take that particular story and subject it to a rigorous set tests. What is the evidence for that story? And I put that word evidence in quotation marks. Okay, well, read the Bible and that's the evidence. It says in Genesis 8.4, there was a flood worldwide and the waters were at least 5,000 meters high above of the present sea level because that's how high Mount Ararat is and Mount Ararat was supposedly flooded. That's a mountain in Turkey, in case you didn't know. It rained, supposedly, for 40 days and 40 nights. The whole thing lasted about 300 days. That's a little more than 10 months. Then the flood, it says in Genesis 8-4, destroyed everything, uh, everything else, I guess. And the arc capacity is actually given in cubits, which is an old uh, measure that is not quite metric, but I've translated this. It's about 150 by 25 by 15 meters. So you can imagine a wooden boat about that size, okay? Fits on a football field or a little bit less. Then it says in Genesis 7, 3, uh, 7, 2, 5, and 3, Noah was instructed to take all sorts of animals, seven of every clean beast, what we call ruminants today, seven of every bird, two of every other kind of animal, okay? And then it says he has to take a, a long food for all of those, including his family, which was also in the boat, right? Note, among other things, there's no marine animals whatsoever, which right there should kind of, well, where do the whales come from, the dolphins and the herring and all that, and the crabs, but no, let's just ignore that for now, right? <laughs> let's, let's take this hypothesis and say it's literally true, which I have to say one more time, about half the population seems to think. So let's test it. Test number one. This is all mental and it's back of the envelope. This is why I've written this out by hand. You don't need a computer for this. You can do this back of the envelope, all right? How much water do you need to actually raise the sea level by five kilometers? That's relatively easy to calculate for anyone, you know, the circumference of the Earth and so forth. You wind up with about 1.3 billion cubic meters of water. Right there, you have to ask yourself, where does this water come from? Is it in the sky? No, it's not there. Is it out of, you know, in outer space? No, it's not there. But let's say there is enough water for this. What is the amount of precipitation that it, you know, that it has to be? And you have only 40 days and 40 nights for this water to come down. Well, it turns out to get about a precipitation rate of five meters per hour. 
Now, for comparison, Edmonton has a precipitation rate of about 35 millimeters per year. So what does that tell you? This would sink any modern aircraft carrier. All right, this is like you have a tiny little toy boat that's maybe three or five centimeters large. You put it in a bathtub, it's paper. You ask the fire department and they come with this five inch hose, bear down with it, <laughs> whoosh. Right? This boat would go under in no time and it would probably get smushed into smithereens. Right? It just doesn't work. It's impossible. And right there, we go back to the field guide for critical thinking. If the claim is valid, there must be a single argument or piece of evidence that invalidates it. Done. Right? So if you want to prove these creationists rock, this is all you need to do. Done. And you can argue with these as long as you will or want with these people, but you will not get very far. I'll get to, get to that in a moment. I'll give you two or three other examples for entertainment anyway. Okay, how about the size of the arc? Again, it's about 150 by 25 by 15 meters. Gives you a certain capacity of about 56,000 cubic meters. And that is if you have no decks and no dividing walls and no staircases or what. You know, just, this is just the hull. Now, today we have, by any conservative estimate, well over a million species of animals, well over half a million of species of plants. And, you know, this is probably about 30 million or so in total, which is what you get from National Geographic. So if, if you're very conservative, you get something like 0.05 cubic meters of species uh, for per, per each species, right? And that's enough for a mosquito and a starling. But how about a giraffe? <laughs> how about, a, you know, a sperm whale? And all of these, uh, just, you can't fit them on the boat. It's just impossible, right? And Gary Larson has put this very nicely into context. You know, one of my favorite <laughs> cartoonists. Right? Now listen up, we're going to do this alphabetically in the zebras. <laughs> they just go, damn. Right? One more of those. How about the food requirement? You know, we have all of these discussions here with the Valley Zoo right now, whether this elephant should be there or not. But if you go to the Valley Zoo, how much does an elephant actually eat? Well, Turns out to be about 160 kilogram of fodder a day, so you make that by you know by uh, 90 multiply by the by the 40 days and 40 nights and whatever that you wind up with 96 tons for a pair of elephants for the voyage, and then you have to add you know for the hippos and the zebras and whatnot and then the moose and the sheep and where on earth do you put all of that food? The animals don't even fit on the boat, let alone the food. Right? It doesn't work. So and what about the carnivores? Right? Gary Larson has that one under control again. So much for the unicorns, he says. From now on, all carnivores will be confined to the sea deck. <laughs> <laughs> and you see a couple of bears there. It's a little washed out, but the bears and everybody's just staring at the, well, you know, when you see that unicorn. So, you know, that doesn't stop these people, uh, these 45, 50% of the general population there to uh, put up things like creation science museums, which have absolutely nothing to do with science, uh, everything to do with doctrine. This is one in Alberta. There's two or three in the States that you can visit. And when you go to this place, it's not far from Drumheller, ironically. Uh, you find displays, dioramas like these. And again, I have to read this out to you because it's washed out on the screen. But it says next to this uh, top display there, uh, the fantastic fossils of the flood display contains only genuine museum quality fossils and a giant model of Noah's Ark. Come find out why these fossils present profound evidence for the flood of Noah. And then, of course, at the bottom, dinosaurs and humans, which I repeat, Stockwell Day is on record as believing it. Our Minister of Public Affairs, or whatever he is right now. Right? This just doesn't cut it. And uh, when you walk around, among other things, you see fossilized <laughs> human leg in a cowboy boot. I, I'm not making this up, right? This, this is just two hours by car from here. And you see a fossilized <laughs> <black boot there. laughs> Tea bears weren't even alive. I mean, <laughs> how can you fossilize something that's not even alive? I like how fossilized is in quotes. And yeah, and, and you have, of course, uh, again, a bit washed out, but I think you can see this. There's numerous of these cases in the literature, and they're all fake. You know, they're all, they make footprints into concrete and then claim it was in some kind of rock that is 200 million years old. 
which conjures up the curious uh, you know, contradiction. They don't believe the Earth is older than 10,000 years in the first place, but it's a permanent rock, which is 200 million years. And how do we do this? Well, I don't know. I can't follow that. And again, gentlemen and ladies, this is why it's, it's actually not a laughing matter. It's because these people run public policy. This is why we can or we shouldn't just ignore this matter as much as I'm tempted to do that. And after all that, of course, I do go on in my courses to cover the theory of evolution, and then it gets much more serious. It is, in fact, the best example in all of the sciences for convergence of evidence, which means, for those who are not familiar with this term, that you have uh, various disciplines all converging on the same result. So we have disciplines here like uh, paleontology, the fossil record. There's all sorts of examples of uh, sequential morphological changes through time. I'm giving four or five of them in my courses like horses, ammonites, dinosaurs, birds, hominids. We have homo longus structures. This is something from anatomy. Uh, we have, uh, uh, for example, if you take you know, the finger bones or the bones in your finger, in your hand anyway, there are homologous structures like this in, in uh, all sorts of other animals. Uh, we have vestigial body parts. This is also anatomy. We have similarities in embryos and various taxa. This is called evo devo today, for those of you who know. And then there's all sorts of uh, microbiological lines of evidence, there's genetic evidence, there's even psychological and mathematical evidence. It just doesn't stop. It doesn't matter from which angle you look at it, it all converges on the same result. 